Hello and welcome. I'm Sonia Koptiev, and we are live at Build 2016 in San Francisco. And we're talking about women in technology today with some inspiring leaders from Microsoft. So welcome and thank you for being here. Absolutely. Can we go through and have you introduce yourselves? Sure, should I start? Absolutely. All right, uh, I'm Julia White, and I've been at Microsoft for 15 years, and I'm currently responsible for product management around Azure, our enterprise security and management area, as well as Windows Server. I'm Lara Rebelke. Oh, is it on? Yep, okay, I'm Lara Rebelke. I'm in the DX organization at Microsoft. I've been at Microsoft for about eight years in a number of different roles. Um, currently, I'm a principal in, uh, software engineer and work with partners to help uh, bring them up to bring their apps up in Azure. Hi, I'm Mitra Zizirod. I'm the general manager of our businesses around Visual Studio, .NET, SQL Server. I'm so excited to be here at Build today. I've been at Microsoft 24 years in a variety of roles. Hi, uh, my name is Julia Lucen. I have also been with Microsoft for 24 years. Uh, and I'm the corporate vice president for Visual Studio and .NET. So this is a huge event for us. And thank you for coming. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so let's open it up with, um, we had a great event here last night uh, for women in technology and uh, exploring the HoloLens uh, area that we have back here. And, and the theme was all about paying it forward. So how do we pay it forward to get more women interested in technology fields and STEM fields? So uh, my question to the panel is, what do you think are some good examples of how we could be paying it forward? Yeah, uh, I guess I'll start. Uh, so, you know, like given how long I have been with Microsoft, uh, I personally do a couple of things. You know, I fundamentally do believe that as someone who has gone through the, the senior ranks, it is part of my goal and my responsibility to kind of open the door for others to follow through. And my goal really is trying to basically say, take the learnings I have and share those with those upcoming you know, um, uh, employees and women and help them make the journey easier and help them understand what are the, some of the common obstacles and just hopefully make that path smoother for them. And the way I do that is that I do a tremendous number of mentoring uh, in Microsoft. And there's also a number of women's events and things like that that I speak at. And I think the again, I think that we uh, I'm also a big sponsor of the you know of the women community within Microsoft because I also feel you know I'm also a mom, and I think that in addition to work, it's super important to have a supported community that you can people can go get the peer mentoring and support. So I'm a big I like to foster those community as well. That's excellent. Thank you. Um, when I was in the field and running public sector, I sponsored the women in technology uh, group in the DC area and, and used that really as sort of a feeder pool to ensure that anytime we had openings, we made sure that, that women were a part of the recruiting pool. It's quite hard uh, very often to find women who come through the pool to even to say, hey, I've interviewed X number of, of diverse candidates. And so really putting some um, stringent guidelines around doing that is something that I feel very strong about. I also spend a lot of time um, speaking externally to Microsoft as well as internally. Um, I go to, for instance, the World Bank and, and talk about women in technology there. I go to different high schools and really encourage uh, girls, especially around the DigiGirls program that we have at Microsoft, um, to get them interested in, in studying science and technology. So excited to do both things internally. And I do think there's a difference, too, between mentoring and sponsoring. Um, I do take the opportunity to sponsor women through their career as well, which is you speak on their behalf very often as, in terms of their career progression and if you know, around um, openings and managers who are looking for other folks. So both mentoring and, and sponsoring and just making sure to be involved in the community. Um, uh, yes, DigiGirls is an awesome program, isn't it? Has anybody, everybody heard about DigiGirls? Yeah, it's a really great program. Uh, I've been involved in that as well for many years. Um, you know, I, I guess I'm going to call out the small things. For me, it's the small things. It seems like a small thing, but uh, just working with people um, throughout my entire career, from way before Microsoft, uh, you know, I started the user group, and it was an opportunity to um, encourage people to present and talk about things that they know and things that they want to share with the, the broader community and use that as a stepping stone to maybe go and learn more about other uh, technologies and speak at other events. 
Um, so I, I do encourage people and, and uh, provide those opportunities. Um, and I've done that throughout my career, and I continue to do that, um, whether it's uh, uh, helping people um, that I work with uh, get set up with Channel 9 and get interviewed and share out some of the technologies that they've been developing, share some of the, uh, the different platforms that they've built out. Um, so for me, it's just giving people a voice and an opportunity to start um, learning how to share that out with other people. So. I say, and, and other than things that we've already talked about, the one area I focus on is an, and campus engagement, of uh, going to the key schools and really sponsoring them and finding women in the, in the pool who are thinking about applying to Microsoft or interested in technology and just letting them know it's a great career and you can be super successful as a woman and, and find them and I, I keep calling them and I encourage them to go through the process and give them tips and tricks on how to interview well at Microsoft and so help essentially sponsor them through that recruiting process so we can get more women in the company and they know what they're getting into when they get there, so kind of getting them through that pipe. Excellent. Um, so following up on the whole, um, the whole process and working through it and the exciting uh, world of Microsoft and the technology field in general, what inspired all of you to get into a STEM career? And what, what made it exciting for you in a career that you wanted to pursue? Sure, I'll start. So I was, uh, was going to be a journalist. That was my initial plan. Um, but then as I was, I was at Stanford and I was in the you know, mecca of all this technology and I kind of found myself stumbling into human computer interactions and seeing how much, like, that, that was super early back then, but the social interaction with computers and how it could change the way we communicated, the way we interacted with each other. And I just, it, it gave me this, um, like aha moment of what technology can do and how profoundly it can change our lives. And then I said, I, I don't know what else I would want to do. I, I have to do that. And to me, it was just that moment of just seeing what's possible with the technology and that I needed to be part of this experience of it. And I think even today is what keeps me there, honestly, of the potential and the possibilities we see. And now even like the things we were doing way, way, way back then, and now we have this uh, you know, conversation as a platform. And I'm like, that's what we wanted to do 20 years ago. <laughs> and we're getting there. Yeah. Well, for, for me, um, I was the top math student in, in high school. I love, 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 love math. So when I went to college, it was natural that I was a literature major. And <laughs> I'm not lying. I did that. I was a literature major. Um, and I, in, in retrospect, I applied mathematics to how I studied literature. It was a very algorithmic approach to it. Um, graduating from college with a degree in literature, you, you go into other different kinds of careers, but you, I, I actually stumbled into what I was supposed to do. Um, I, I was right out of college, I was doing some HR, I was managing a team, I was doing some stuff and just stumbled into the opportunity to start building out a data system. And when, you know how it is when you're at work and you lose time? I lost time. You know, this was just a thing that I do. It's a thing I love to do, a thing I continue to love to do. And for me, it was just a natural. So I just happened to fall into it. And um, so that's my story, I guess. Thank you. I think there's a theme of falling into things. I actually had applied to the World Bank in Washington, DC, and I wanted to work in international relations. Um, and I had uh, a minor in computer science. And so it ended up at that time, and this was 1985, uh, that they wanted somebody to come in and start up their computer learning center. And I had, I had computer science experience, I had programming experience, and um, I started teaching the economists how to use technology. In those days, it really was as simple as the Lotus 1, 2, 3 spreadsheet. And then it came time to install the first network at the World Bank. It was a deck all in one network. And, and I really just cut my teeth in terms of designing networks, learning all the protocols, and getting super, super involved on the job and that from that point on um, found that that was a, a super calling and also there weren't hardly any women doing that at that point so um, it was an exciting thing to do and so I just continued from that point on but it truly wasn't anything um, that I planned. Well I guess I'm the only exception here. <laughs> I do have an electrical engineering, computer engineering degree. So my journey is that I, uh, I was born and grew up in China uh, and I, well, now when I reflect, and I came over to, um, to the U.S. for college, and when I reflect sort of my journey, I think there's really two key things for me. One is that when I was growing up, um, the particular college entrance requirement that was, you know, in China, you know, then and now, 
basically says that as a girl, you don't have an excuse. Like, you still have to be really good at math. You cannot say, oh, you know, it's okay. You don't have to be good at math. Sometimes a parent, I hear that a little bit more in the U.S. And you don't hear that when you're growing up. Because if you want to make into college, you have to be, be pretty good at math. You have to go get overall sort of scores. So, uh, and then the other thing is that my role model is also my mom, uh, who is an engineer. Uh, and she was actually working on... Uh, in, the, uh, in the 80s was working on the sort of laser printing system uh, for Chinese. So they were building hardwares and softwares and OS and everything. And she was actually primarily working on the hardware side. So I think that was definitely, so I kind of never had it in my head that I always look at something pretty cool that she did. I never had it in my head that no girls cannot be in this or that. Uh, I think that was super helpful how I got into computer science. So that's how I ended up uh, joining Microsoft as a developer right after I graduated. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. So if there was one piece of advice, and given all the varied background, this is great. Um, what piece of advice would you give a young woman who is interested in STEM career, STEM profession? So um, I will, I'll start this way. So um, when I think about you know, the, my journey, I think, in the past, probably one of the most important things I would say is that don't let others' opinion influence your, how you view yourself and what you want to do. I can think of so many instances in my life or in my, you know, in, whether it's in university, et cetera, that professor would say something, you know, I remember very distinctly this one professor said, I think the best student in my class will be someone who had tinkered with electronics in their garages. I'm like, I never had a garage growing up. <laughs> I don't know what tinkering was electronics look like because those are not available when I grew up in China. But it doesn't matter. I didn't like those comments kind of like this drag me or kind of like, Know, made me think that I'm not going to be great in that class. I kind of like, hey, I'm going to keep working on this and I can learn. I'm a fast learner. I think that belief in yourself to continually to go work and improve and make progress. And you know, same thing in career, in, 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 later on in, uh, in, um, you know, in Microsoft, in other careers, there's a lot of doubters. They're like, can you do it? You know, there's kind of like, you know, like, hey, I'm the only girl in the class. I'm the only woman in this conference room, whatever. But don't let those things discourage you. Um, I agree with Julia in terms of um, other folks' opinions. In fact, um, people often ask me, what's the best advice you ever got? And honestly, I never, I never got advice that I took because the advice was always, um, it was almost always the opposite. It was like, gosh, you really don't know me at all. I would never do that. And so um, it always was a little bit more, I mean, I used to, to go out and, and I remember when I was expecting, I, people would come up to me and say, oh, we're really going to miss you here. Because, you know, once you have a, a kid, you're never going to come back to work kind of thing or just, you know, advising you to do things like that. Or in terms of, you know, being fluid in your career. When I started at Microsoft, there were 300 engineers and only nine were women. And I was one of, the, of those nine. Um, and going in and working within the DOD and the intelligence communities and all of that, it was an incredibly male-oriented environment to be a security specialist and all those sort of things. I, I, from that point, you know, folks thought, oh, she'll play with this a little while and then she'll go do something else. I was also the first female um, technology director we had in the East region, which is today we call them a CTO. And then moving from that into running large businesses and then coming back to technical things. I think it's, you know, also if we talk about STEM, you know, everyone's life takes a very fluid sort of approach. And so it's great to experience things and work in every sort of pipe that you can, but really understand what your own strengths are and listen to your own gut. So from my perspective, my own instincts have been to go against the grain and it's worked for me. There's always been you know, peaks and valleys as there are in anybody's lives. Um, but, but having that sense of fluidity, knowing I'm not stuck in any particular thing, makes all the difference. So I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach to this. Um, so my niece graduated high school last year. She's uh, studying engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And um, I, I had heard from a friend of mine, I, I, somebody I work with at, at Microsoft, his father was a math teacher and he was telling me this story when he was in college and some advice his father had given me and when he told me that advice I'm like oh my gosh that's so awesome I wish somebody would have told me that when I was in college so when my niece was uh, getting ready to go to college um, I gave her this same advice when in doubt take math <laughs> so if you're interested in going into STEM um, there are so many different 
ways that you can approach the different majors and, you know, it can be overwhelming. Um, but at the end of the day, math is foundation to everything, everything. And so when in doubt, take math. The rest of it, you can layer on top of it. And that's, I guess, the piece of advice I'd give to somebody in STEM. Uh, and from an advice perspective, I would say uh, just be authentic and stay true to who you are. And I think when you work in a male or dominated or oriented or typed uh, culture, it can be easy to feel like you need to assimilate and you need to not be who you are. And that just doesn't work. You can only do that for so long before you're exhausted and you don't want to do it anymore. And the truth is, like, we bring a different energy. We can bring a different perspective. And so be authentic and be proud about being authentic to who you are. A little bit of pulling from each of like, it's okay to go against the grain. Like, that's why we're there. That's what we're doing. We're helping drive a different perspective, a different change. And be proud about that and unapologetic about being exactly who you are and what you do and way, how you dress and however that is. That's great. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I think we have some time for questions. If anyone in the audience wanted to come up and ask a question. Don't all come up at once. No? No? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for the great panel. I had the following question. So looking at the audience, it looks like here we have a great concentration of women, but overall at build, not so much. Is there any effort that Microsoft is putting into increasing this, changing this, that next year we see more than one in 20? <laughs> Yes, absolutely. And so uh, this is some of the initial steps that we're taking. And we also had uh, passes available for women and um, friends of developers who were here as well who were women. Uh, some chose to take advantage of it, which is actually partially what you're seeing here. And then we also have other folks that are mingling around the expo also that are women. But yes, we are actively working on getting more women here. Let me just add one point. There's actually, we also realize we have a very bad pipeline problem. Looking at the number of you know, graduates coming out from computer science, I think that for US overall, it's less than 20%. 20% is just women. That, you know, like, if that percentage keeps carrying on, that we're never kind of over the 20% mark. And so we have a pipeline problem. So one of the things that we have invested in the last four or five years now is really try to go help women interest in the STEM career early in college. So we have a fantastic program called Explore. We're trying to get women when they're like sophomore, had haven't really quite picked a major yet, get them into Microsoft. So they're like seeing how interesting, how cool, and really build that confidence and help them choose a STEM career later. So there's a variety of different things that we're doing. But getting back to your point about your daughter and encouraging your, encouraging your daughter to um, also take those STEM classes and STEM activities and things like that, I think it also has to start much earlier than college, right? Because by college, you've already gotten some background where you at least have interest one way or the other. And again, it's not a given because clearly, you know, having a degree in literature gets you into STEM as well. But the interest has to start much earlier. And I, I completely agree. This is a topic I can go on for a long time because I'm super I passionate. I, when I see my, I have a son, but. Oh, I'm sorry. My son's friends, just the parents talk sometimes really drive me a little crazy. And I see, I'm hoping that you get to really help us take that, you know, action item or that kind of word out is that don't let the parents you know, like say it's okay that you're not good at math. One of my very good friend in Microsoft, now she's also a principal level engineer working on Windows, uh, graduated from Stanford with a master. Uh, I, she was show me, share with me the story that when she was uh, in, the, in the beginning of the high school, she ran into a, like basically the problem solving in the math got a little challenging. And she was like, she was like, you know, having troubles for the first time in her life, you know, struggling with math. But her dad was the super positive influencer. Her dad worked with her on her homework every night. And then after like six months, she got over that hump and then she never had trouble again and went to Stanford, etc. So as a parent, as a friend, as an aunt, you know, as a as parent, you know, yeah. as dad, you know, there's a lot you can do to help girls succeed when they're yeah. having it, trouble. It definitely starts at home. It yeah. started at home with me. It was my dad. My dad was the super positive force in all of that. It was of course, you know, we love math, we love this, and, you know, that starts home. Yes. So, you guys are all highly successful, and I have two very young kids, one and four. So, how have you managed balancing home life, career life, being highly successful in your career and what you do? I mean, maintaining oneself as well. How have you balanced that? One day at a time, man. Yeah, no kidding, right? <laughs> 
Yeah. No, if there was a secret recipe, we'd all be uh, we'd all be less stressed. Uh, no, you have to. For me, I have to look at it the long the long range. Day to day, month to month, I might be way out of kilter. I might be traveling and working like mad. And other months, I might have extra time to spend with my family. Over the co longer course of time, I feel good about how I how I shape my time and what I do. Um, but in the in the micro sense, it might not feel great. And you can't beat yourself up for that. Like one week, I know it's hard, but then it'll get different over the course of time. And just frankly, be forgiving of yourself. Like it's not, it's messy. It's hard. There's my kids want more time. My job wants more time. Everybody wants more time. And, and I, it's okay, but you have to not, not beat myself up for that and just be like, I'm going to do the best I can. And I'm going to show up every day the best I can and be present when I'm with the different spaces and, and be okay with that. I was, I, oh, I, I was just going to say, I, I got a, a, the luxury of a stay at home husband. So that helps a lot. Um, he hasn't always been when we first had kids. We both worked full time and we figured out a way that um, we could still have the kids in daycare in shorter days. And by my going into work really early, him leaving work a little later. And you just kind of work out what that balance has to be for you guys to feel comfortable with, you know, how much your time you're at work and how much time your kids are at daycare if you have to do daycare. Um, and the, uh, as the years went on, you know, my husband made a decision. He wanted to be stayed at home with the, with the kids and that helped a lot. But not everybody has that luxury and I consider myself very fortunate right now. So. Um, I think for Julia and I, there's not many women who have actually stayed at Microsoft 24 years. So we get asked a lot and we've raised our families. My kids are in college now and I had them at Microsoft. I would say um, Early on, I would back. Uh, I would say around 1999, 2000, I was actually looking for some senior level women, and I, I wanted to look at the women who had left Microsoft, and I wanted to see if anybody was ready to come back. And so I, I told HR, hey, I'm going to call folks and, and see what's up with this list of women who have left. And almost to a person, even though that's not what they said in their exit in interviews, because we do exit interviews, it's always like, hey, I want to spend more time with my family, but. Every single one of the people that I called was actually working somewhere else. Um, and so the issue is you, you really have to be honest about what you need in the workplace. I put very strict boundaries around things or I wouldn't have been here 24 years. So at the beginning of the year, I always mapped out, here's, here's my kids' sports, here's their plays, here's this. And I never said, oh, that's OK. I won't go do that. I'm going to come to that meeting instead. Because the minute you do that, then people understand that they can push you on that. And so if you stay really true to that, they stop asking you. And because I'm that way, I instill that in my team, which is get your stuff that's really important to you, because we all work too hard not to make sure that the stuff that's really important to you and your family is really protected, that you put boundaries around it. And therefore, when you are spending that extra time, you don't feel like you're missing out on anything. You know, and so at the end of the day, I do think it's up to us too to articulate what we need and make sure we set the boundaries around it. Because in all of those cases, they could make it work someplace else, but they didn't really tell anybody what was really happening with them here. And I've been very vocal about that. And so more and more that we can instill, especially within women, um, you know, it's fine that you can't go to that meeting. You got this thing over here with you. You got the. I, re I remember one time. I took a red eye back from Seattle just to go on a hayride for Halloween, which I ended up getting a piece of straw in my eye that morning. It was not a great morning, but I was there. Um, so, you know, even for that kind of thing. But I always told people what I was doing. I never said, oh, you know, I'm dying. I have a doctor's appointment. I was like, no, I'm, I'm going on a hayride. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, this was excellent, excellent discussion, wonderful points. And hopefully we can do much, much more of this. Uh, in the future and with a much bigger audience. So, and thank you all for being here. Thank you.